Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Creative Insider Podcast number 60 with me, Georgi Starsky. Time flies, and we're already at the number 60. Uh, it took a long time to make this one happen, but we managed, and I'm really happy that uh, we got these two guys on. So time to reveal the guests of this episode, which were Ted Schaumann and Jonas Norgren. Uh, they are the founders of the architectural practice, uh, which is split between Copenhagen and Helsinki, and which, of course, is named after them. It's called Schaumann Norgren. And uh, when I was a student, I, I found this uh, office uh, through Arc Daily or one of those uh, online architectural magazines, and they've been um, a big inspiration for me. And uh, they didn't know that. Now I had the opportunity to tell them personally and to reveal to the rest of you what is their story, how they left Kobe, where they were working. Kobe, it's a huge office um, in Copenhagen. And uh, they started their own practice. Uh, what were their first difficulties? Um, how they managed to survive and how they got to where they are today where um, they have two offices, one in Copenhagen, one in Helsinki, and they have won multiple architectural competitions and they have their own team and yeah, they're um, growing and it's um, amazing that uh, they had time and um, patience to share this whole story. So I suggest you to listen to the whole conversation because I think it's a real inspiration for any architect out there and I suggest you to listen get inspired and maybe try yourself but before we start a conversation i want to thank you first of all for taking your time for listening our podcast and i want to remind you that it's very important that if you want to um, keep the show alive uh, it's important to support us um, you can do that for free by just subscribing to the platform you're listening on and leaving a good review if that's possible uh, for example, on Apple Podcasts. Um, but it's also important that we can stay in touch with you. So we suggest you to go on the creativeinsider.com where you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter. Uh, you'll get the best of every month of each episode. So you won't need to listen to all the episodes. We'll send you an email. Uh, for the one that already subscribed, I suggest you to go in your email and uh, set up that we're not... Uh, junk or commercial or whatever uh, so that you can actually see the email and um, of course it's a great way to to support us by just sharing with with your friends uh, with your colleagues with your family sharing on your social media about our podcast episodes so that we reach more and more people and of course follow our social media channels which are instagram at tca podcast and the linkedin page the creative insider uh, also, we have putting, uh, we've been putting a lot of work into making all these 60 episodes until now happen. Uh, we've been putting on a lot of money into putting together the gear. We know that it get, needs to get better, more professional. We trial, we were trying to, to do video also very soon, but all this needs uh, some economical resources. So if you think we are part of your life, we're giving you an added uh, value in your daily life as a creative, uh, please do consider going on Patreon and support us. You can do that with five bucks a month or if you can do less, pick another amount of money. And we're also working on creating uh, different uh, perks for the people who are going to subscribe to our Patreon. So yeah, well, I think uh, I've been talking enough now. I want to wish you a pleasant listening to the conversation with Ted and Jonas. Enjoy. The more world stops just like that.
Hello, Ted. Hello, Jonas. How are you guys? Hello. Nice to nice to be here. I think we are both great, even though we're not yeah. in the same location. <laughs> exactly. And uh, hi to you also, Georgie. Hello. Um, it's been uh, it's been a, a a long time that I've been waiting for this conversation, as I told you in our conversation before we started recording is that uh, I'm a huge, huge uh, fan of the work of your office, uh, Shaman and Norgren. And um, I would, uh, I don't know how I found your work. I think it was on Arc Daily or somewhere. Um, and Or maybe on Google Maps, because sometimes I go on Google Maps and do like type in Architects Copenhagen or Architects Helsinki or somewhere. And uh, while I was doing my thesis, I really loved the uh, architectural representation of your work. So I would go in your website and do with the snipping tool, like a picture of some of the plants I liked and then <laughs> pick the colors because I really love the colors. Uh, so thank you for accepting the, the invitation. And if you want, you can introduce a little bit yourself to, to the audience and to whoever is listening. Sure. You want to go first? Yeah. Yeah, I can start. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Ted Schaumann. I'm uh, born in Finland and uh, um, at the moment I also live in, in Finland and run our Helsinki office. Um, my background is that uh, I grew up here uh, but studied uh, abroad and uh, that's where I met uh, Jonas back in the days 10, 11 years ago in Copenhagen. Nice yeah. to be here. Yeah, and uh, and um, uh, yeah, my name is Jonas, as uh, uh, we said before, and uh, I am uh, originally from Helsingborg, uh, Sweden. Um, I live in Malmo, but I commute to Copenhagen every day, um, and um, uh, runs the Copenhagen operations basically. Um, and um, uh, I studied also, as Ted said, in uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, at the Royal Art Academy, and then before that, I studied actually furniture design at the the Dan Denmark's Design School uh, for three years. Um, so that's kind of my educational background: first furniture design, and then architecture. I've I've never been to to Copenhagen. We met in two thousand and ten. I've never been to Copenhagen, but isn't it expensive to travel every day between Malmo and uh, Copenhagen? Yeah, that's a good question. It is a little bit uh, pricey, but uh, I would say like that there is some. Um, uh, it's a quite nice and dynamic uh, area and region in that sense. That basically like the the so southern parts of Sweden were Danish uh, a few hundred years back, and um, there is quite. There's always been like um, a, a lot of uh, uh, kind of cultural exchange between um, uh, uh, the two coasts like the west coast of south sweden and the east coast of um, of denmark there so uh, so like uh, it, it is a little bit pricey i would say for for uh, integrating the regions more but it's um, it's uh, still worth it i would say um, and it's uh, i think it's um, fascinating to um, to um, to kind of be in a region which where you have two nationalities and it's just basically half an hour 45 minutes away so it is a little bit like commuting commuting in, a, in your own city uh, in your own country and i've actually i've been commuting for uh, 18 years in total which is quite a long time <laughs> so both during education and during my whole professional career basically uh i guess that the the company or the guys or the whoever owns that bridge <laughs> it's very thankful to you <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, I'm really curious. Like, um, how did you how did you decide to to become designers or creatives or an architects? Uh, from abroad, this seems a very I don't know common decision in Scandinavia in general, and uh, I think that uh, currently the whole Scandinavian region has a huge prolific I don't know generation or a few generations of uh, very good architects. Um, so I'm curious, maybe we start with Ted and then Jonas, how, how come this to, the, to this decision in your life? Yeah, sure. Actually, um, I guess uh, one of maybe the main reasons behind uh, 
the fact that I became an architect is the is the fact that my dad is actually an architect and uh, he had his office in my hometown very close to our home basically upstairs and I kind of grew up grew up there and running back and forth between the home and the office so I kind of grew up with and kind of the atmosphere of an architect's office which grew from a smaller office to a bigger and but actually during my like school years I wasn't sure if I was gonna become an architect it, would be, it took some time uh, to decide there was some other options also on the table at some point but in the end it it was quite uh, natural I think that that's maybe one of the main reasons it's, it's very it's logical very, <laughs> it's very common it's very common I have yeah. had a couple of friends also in my university that had followed this uh, this path of their parents yeah exactly yeah but I mean some I think some uh, some parents uh, it, it feels like there's a tendency to either recommend to become like to tell your kids to either become an architect or definitely doesn't don't become an architect so that's kind of it's it's almost 50 50 I guess uh, based on what I've heard but uh, I didn't have any I mean, no one told me to become an architect at home. It was completely just uh, up to me. Uh, no, or no one told me not to become either. So it was kind of, in the end, it felt like my own uh, choice. How about you, Jonas? Yeah, uh, basically, I mean, I had a. I don't have that background. I ha my my dad, dad is a psychiatrist, so I I didn't really have like any any kind of uh, uh, architectural kind of context. I, I hadn't actually been into a, uh, an architect firm until I was uh, in my, I think it was my third, yeah, after my third year in, in school, uh, in architect school. So so basically I, I was just very fascinated with art. I went to Luciana uh, in Denmark, uh, seeing like a lot of uh, great painters and didn't really know, I knew I wanted to work with something creative. Um, and then I tried out a few things and then I started to study at the Denmark's design school um, uh, where I sort of started to do with uh, work with furniture. But this idea of architecture and quite, quite kind of working with spaces and uh, communities and conditions in a bigger scale was um, uh, something that I, I kind of discovered during uh, my studies studying uh, uh, furniture design. So that's basically I was I was quite old when I started to to sort of make up my mind about studying architecture. Uh, I had almost almost done my bachelor in furniture design. So I was like 23, 24 or something like that when I started to stu uh, when I decided and applied to architect school. So that's when I decided basically. But it has sort of been brewing under the the kind of within all the different kind of things that was fa that fascinated me from being an early teenager to being like 10 years old or older almost <laughs> at, at what point did you guys met like did you meet um, at the university already or did you meet uh, because I'm I've opened also your LinkedIn accounts that I think that's also very uh, very helpful medium to follow in this podcast because there you have sort of the chronological education and the chronological career uh, so where did you meet yeah actually we met in uh in Copenhagen, that was, was it 2009, you want to say, I think. Yeah, yeah. 9, 10, yeah. just a mix between there. Yeah, I had, it was actually quite a funny, funny story because I, I studied my, uh, the first part of my education, my bachelor in, in England, actually. And then I decided to move to Copenhagen for an internship to an, to an office where I then worked for a year. And then after that internship, I decided to apply to the School of Architecture in Copenhagen. And then I got in and uh, started at the first year of the master's studies. And that's when uh, when I met uh, Jonas. We, <laughs> we went on a, this kind of first week introduction uh, trip to, to Sweden on a bus with the, with the studio and I didn't know anyone, but there was one guy who talked really a lot and also talked to me. And then we just happened to sit next next to each other. And uh, and uh, since he was talking a lot and I didn't know anyone, <laughs> I felt it was quite quite natural. 
So that's that's where it all started. I think uh, that's that's what I come across like uh, since the first few minutes of our conversation <laughs> that uh, because the uh, like um, when I was trying to invite you, I start I texted I think first Jonas, and then I didn't have any reply. So I thought like okay. Or maybe I had a reply, but the reply wasn't like yes or no, it was something else. But there was a number. So I called Jonas and then Jonas started like uh, telling me, yeah, this is a totally cool idea. And uh, I can suggest you also other guests, like I have friends. And, and I was thinking like, it, but he was talking a lot and I was thinking, okay, let's first do the podcast with you guys <laughs> and then, uh, and then let's, we move to your friends. <laughs> and then we started the conversation today and I haven't talked to you, Ted, before. So I thought like, okay, this one guy is more quiet, <laughs> the other guy talks, <laughs> talks, uh, talks more, but that's, that's cool. I, I'm pretty talkative too and I, had, I, came, I'm a, I came in Frankfurt, I'm based in Frankfurt and I came here as an Erasmus student. And I had a really good Finnish friend who was also here in Erasmus. And we were a similar like couple of friends because he was very quiet and I was <laughs> very loud. So <laughs> I, it's, I think it works. Um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm very quiet, but I'm at least more quiet than, than you was. <laughs> 90% of the whole world is uh, probably uh, more quiet than me. But I mean, I can also take a kind of a, if someone, I mean, it has happened a few times because I, 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 when I think I, I talk uh, and that's not always super good, but it's, that's just how I function. And sometimes like uh, when, when, like when I've been sort of trying to find out an idea, I've been talking a little bit in circles sometimes only me and Ted discussing uh, some idea or whatever it is. And then he has said like, uh, uh, Jonas, now you've been spinning around this, um, this idea, just, uh, wait one moment and i'll just uh, formulate something i mean I, uh, you know that the i mean i don't have a problem if anyone interrupts me because i know who i am and i'm 40 years old so i know i'm not going to change <laughs> so it's like if someone just asks me to be quiet then uh, then uh, it's fine so yeah. otherwise i mean otherwise it would be a problem yeah. but, but it was super nice yeah. because then it was very easy to get into i mean all the people in the masters uh, class uh, knew each other and uh, I was the Finnish guy who didn't speak Danish, and uh, it helped helped a lot to get into that. Yeah. What What kind of language did you guys speak at the university, and what kind of what uh, language you speak now when you have, um, like uh, the office? Because uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, although the countries like Finland, uh, Sweden, and, and Denmark are quite close. Um, I mean, in Finland, you have Swedish and and um, um, and Finnish, the, like the two different languages. And in Denmark, you have Danish and then Sweden, Sweden, Swedish. But they're not very similar language, aren't they? Well, I mean, uh, the thing is that me and me and Ted speak Swedish because uh, uh, Ted is a Finnish Swede, but Ted also speaks Danish. Um, he learned that quite pretty fast, as I would remember, right? Uh, Swedish and Danish are close to each other, while Finnish is completely different. Finnish is kind of the language outside the other Nordic languages. But as Jonas mentioned, I'm, I'm Swedish speaking, so we, we speak uh, Swedish. And in the office, we kind of speak all kinds speak of languages. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But um, it, it, the, it kind of the office language is uh, English in a way. It becomes that because it's... Uh, since we have like uh, uh, different nationalities, it's just what we talk like on a uh, daily basis. Me and Ted speak Swedish with each other, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but I, I think like uh, oh, sorry, no, you no, go ahead. Yeah, and sorry. and I see that you have a pretty like small team, but very international. So the, I guess that although like the people are not so many, but the backgrounds and cultures within your office are quite a lot still mm. yeah exactly. but that's also what we think is uh, quite fun because uh, people bring a lot of different things to the table and when we get applications uh, i mean it's we just look at the portfolio and see if uh, if it's uh, like kind of the the vibe it has and then also um, uh, starting at that point um, to sort of uh, find a good team and then of course it's an interview and then uh, uh, hopefully 
we get a new colleague <laughs> at some point. So that's kind of like, and then it ends up being like that, I think, in a way. Um, because the world is is uh, one big bowl uh, and uh, there is a lot of nice people in the world. So um, uh, you get an international team, uh, even j that's just how it is somehow. And um, I'm, I'm, if, if you're open for it. I'm curious, like, um, like uh, is there anything special that you guys think was taught to you in the, I, I, I suppose you studied at the Royal Academy of Arts in Denmark, uh, because, um, I don't know, like from, from the, the external side, like currently I live in Germany and here, uh, even Germany that like <laughs> it scales up sort of, because when I was in Italy, like the model was Germany, Switzerland. And then I came here and the model is like the Northern countries like Denmark and Sweden uh, for architecture. Um, is there something in this school that is special that generates so many, so many architects? Because for example, like, um, I think everything, there were some, there are some very established offices in Denmark for a longer time now. And then Bjorki Ingels is in my opinion, the guys that make made Danish culture or culture of design very popular around the world and um but what he says in the movies or documentaries that has been made about him it's that's very traditional school and i've watched also a documentary with the kobe founder um dan stubegard and then he also said that he realized how architecture is done only once he has moved to the netherlands so what what do you guys think is something changed while you have been studying there that that school gave to you or what what something that you enjoyed about that school go ahead you want to start okay. <laughs> okay no but then then i think that like uh for me it's been like um uh, a few different steps first since i studied furniture design first uh, i knew uh, kind of a few things about architecture and were was fascinated by a few architects and that's what, of course why i started to study it but in relation to the school, I think just as uh, as uh, Dan and, and Bjarke maybe pointed out, what was that the school was maybe, or maybe somehow still is, I don't really know exactly how it is now, but maybe there, there was some kind of like a classical approach to architecture, like how you compose um, spaces and, uh, and, um, and uh, structures. But, but I, I think that um, what, if I go to the time when I got to know, know Ted, when we, when we started uh, to study together, um, uh, then I think that um, it was uh, uh, a lot that, you know, we didn't really talk necessarily so much about always exactly what the teachers were thinking. We, we talked a lot about like, and sketched a lot because m both in, me and Ted uh, sketch uh, quite a lot, uh, uh, like hand sketch. So a lot of our conversations and like ideas about architecture c came from that conversation and not necessarily from the school. Of course, you had, um, you had the lectures, fantastic lectures, and you had uh, really good teachers and all these things. But our fascination for, uh, for uh, how we wanted to kind of uh, work with architecture came from, uh, from a lot of our conversations. So I think that the environment is, uh, is quite fantastic, um, or at least was uh, really fantastic for uh, for getting a, a good study climate, I think. Um, and also the social environment is nice. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I came from a completely different uh, starting point since I studied in, in uh, the UK. And I have to say, I mean, I know, I mean, I never studied in, in Finland, but I always know something about what happens in the schools here in, in Finland. And then I, of course, know something about how how it's done in, in the UK, <clears throat> and then comparing uh, the Copenhagen school, it's, uh, I think it's actually a quite a good balance between kind of a, a classical way of teaching architecture and a very practical, I mean, I think nowadays, it seems like there's a good balance between a strong connection to the, the real world, a lot of uh, teachers and uh, professors are connected to to practices and uh, and offices, 
and uh, somehow I, I mean compared to Finland it's uh, less technical the Finnish schools are more technical and then compared to the UK at least it felt like it was less theoretical so it was somewhere in between which is quite good because you get the kind of theoretical backgrounds while you still focus on the design aspect not being too technical on the other end so so mm. I, I i felt it's uh, it, it gave at least us a good starting point i think mm. i concur and I, I think that um and i think that also the presence of this um, university and universities in general in denmark and uh, now very high number of presence of companies has created um i call it a little bit the silicon valley effect but in the terms of architecture because um a lot of people claim that um silicon valley it's there because you have all the high tech companies but also the universities that uh are like stanford that are very uh, successful and now in in copenhagen you have like um a lot of companies that are at very very high level also very renowned around europe and and the world um and i was curious like was it for you easier the transition from the academical world to the professional world um how did like you ted have been doing the internship while right away when you um came from england but then after the masters and so far how has been the transition to then the real work life yeah that's also a good uh, i mean this is maybe a good example because i think it was maybe the last semester or the second to last where we had uh, dan stubergard from kobe as a external sensor and that was a project well, and we all presented uh, our studio projects and uh, Jonas and I had done a, a project together, an urban plan. And after the that presentation, I think we we were asked by Dan to come and work one summer in, at Kobe. Uh, and then that that's what happened. Then we worked for a summer at Kobe and actually Jonas stayed for a long, uh, we both stayed for a bit longer. And, and then after the, the after the final semester of the studies, uh, we immediately jumped uh, to Kobe and started our professional careers uh, in that way. So that's maybe a good example of the connection to the between the schools and the, the real world. And and how was your your working experience there? Uh, did you? um i don't know when i first uh, got my job because um here in germany you have the opportunity to work as a student um, um because also like the companies if they hire you uh, they'll pay less taxes um so when i started i just by working at, at the first company where i worked i learned so much about the workflow and how to be more efficient and how to be faster in what i do um the the conceptual part like what they teach you at school like how to make a project that's pretty much the same but the like creating the project then it gets faster what what was there something that for you was a real game changer when started to working for a company like uh, Kobe well I, I think that like since we had the um, uh, the internship that we did together at uh, Kobe uh, there um, uh, within our master's program as Ted mentioned then we we had uh, also that teacher that we had um, uh, in in um, uh, in school he's also he's also working at uh, Kobe um, uh, so so like w when we were there you sort of uh, continued a little bit uh, in the way that also we had been taught in uh, in school because it was kind of like a, a conversational kind of uh, platform for the for the in our study uh, department so that was quite uh, 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 it was quite quite a nice transition uh, from from uh, school uh, to the the internship and then from the internship where you sort of tried it out uh, did you, we did our thesis and then we we got into kind of a more 
yeah a reality as a as an employee or as employees but i think that the transition was quite smooth here because um it was uh, like when we did the, the internship uh the extra internship or how you can say it um then uh, uh we we did a, a project that we also won and then ted went back to school uh, and i continued a little bit um a longer uh, uh prolonging my intern so internship so ted and i could do our thesis together um so so we did like one collaborative project together where dan was the external sensor then we did an extra internship at Kobe, went back to school and finished our thesis and then started to work um, at Kobe. So it was kind of a, you could say, a kind of smooth transition from uh, from the academic world to the to the kind of more professional world. But even on the like practical, practical side of the of the work, because, for example, what for me, what I learned more in the office a, a part of architecture because uh, related to architecture it got more like real because i learned uh, all the german laws and what you need to you know um, take care about like to make a project what sometimes in the academical world they don't really require it like to be extremely strict um, especially i came from italy where the school was very much into really how to make a concept in your head and not so much the regulations. German was more about uh, the technology of architecture and how to make it buildable so the two were good. And when I joined the office, um, what for me was very helpful was all this organization about how all the projects, files or information are structured, about how to use the different softwares together so that you actually achieve what as a student you achieve in a longer time because you're just chaotic and everything you do you just need to figure it out yourself um but what is there was for you the same when you joined the professional world like on this side to be more organized or i don't know to do dif different things faster somehow was there any effect of this or you were already kind of prepared very well from from your own experience I think because we went kind of back and forth, we first started uh, with some influence from uh, like teachers in school, like connected to our future, like first workplace. Then we went for a short internship and went back to school. We got kind of into the system quite uh, smoothly, as Jonas mentioned. It, it never felt like a big step that, okay, now, uh, now we are kind of graduated architects and should know everything about uh, laws and uh, structures and this it felt kind of as a uh, kind of quite smooth curve going up upwards hmm. uh, and, and then me. and then yeah and, and then on that note what Ted is saying is basically I think that the career after that uh, has sort of just continued in the same way you just continue to learn uh, and accumulate uh, um, you could say like uh, uh knowledge and uh, and ideas about process idea generating and all these things uh, just continuing like that both when we were employees and also then when we started our own firm and if you sort of uh, use the famous uh, steve jobs quote you can never connect the dots by uh, looking forward you can only connect the dots by looking backwards so when you sort of like look back to towards uh, or uh, not towards but in hindsight back to how both probably me, how me and Ted have developed as architects. I think that there is like kind of um, a few uh, kind of points where we were very fascinated about a certain thing. Uh, I know that at least for myself, because I started to study furniture design first and then just focused on large scale architecture. So I, I've always had this kind of uh, fascination for something uh, uh, within the field of architecture. And I know that also from from Ted, uh, when we are like hearing from how he he, he studied uh, when he was in Plymouth, uh, and also when he was at the uh, powerhouse as an intern there, um, you know, that you were re very focused on learning things when there was a new obstacle, uh, and then bringing that knowledge uh, in your your continuation of how you how you kind of work as a as an architect. And, and that's basically still how it is, I think. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, uh, I think at least for myself, I mean, I bump into new uh, issues and problems every day. 
uh, and uh, it's really good to have a, a really good friend and a colleague to to discuss them every once in a while and i think that that's a little bit how it was um, when we were in school and also how it was to be colleagues uh, uh, when we were working together as employees uh, but now of course we have both the responsibility for our own work but also for our colleagues uh, which of course also adds some new complexity to to not only being a an architect but also being uh, uh, hopefully a good employer and uh, a good colleague uh, to to the other guys in the office and um, I'm curious what kind of um, <clears throat> work did you need to because you stayed uh, I don't know from what I see here from your like um, at least what LinkedIn says is that you stayed uh, around four years each in in um, Kobe and uh, what kind of uh, task you had there like you were more in the competitions or you moved to be more on the executive um, part because in Denmark then you have also like two different studies um, you have like normal architecture and then constructive construction architect which is more really into this technical side of the job um, how is the what were your tasks and how is generally in uh, I don't know if it's a general Danish um, structure in the architecture office. Do you really have some guys that do all the concept design and competitions in this early phase and then you switch it to the constructive architects or mm -hmm. how does it work? What were your tasks? Yeah. I mean, I think Ewan as an I, we never actually worked on the on the same kind of same project that uh, Kobe for four or five years. But I think we were kind of lucky to get the chance to be involved in all kinds of uh, tasks and uh, projects and uh, situations uh, during those uh, four or five years, which was fantastic. I mean, I think some offices probably have some bigger offices have the competition department and then the constructing uh, <clears throat> department. But but at least I I got the chance, and uh, Jonas also got the chance to be part of both like huge urban planning uh, projects to building uh, architecture projects to uh, almost like uh, uh, urban spaces and also within those projects in all phases <clears throat> from competition to detailed design which was uh, a very good uh, backbone for continuing with your own office yeah, so, so that was that was also like the uh, since both me and Ted w has been fascinated, and that's probably also why we clicked in school because we were both fascinated by large scale urban planning, which where it it becomes like you know almost like politics, you need or like uh, there is so many disciplines you need to sort of um, have a relate or have an understanding or at least a hun hunch about what it's about. Uh, and and um, it's a completely different process from in relation to when you design a handle or like a, a, a detail. So it's two different kind of mindsets that is needed. But since we were both fascinated by that in school, uh, we had some kind of background information for that. So at the Kobe as employees, um, we also got like a, um, the chance to to work on both like because uh, I mean uh, during the time there I, I both did like uh, interior uh, architecture for two uh, daycare uh, no one school and one daycare uh, uh, project at the Kobe but I also we were also involved in um, both me and Ted in like large-scale architecture uh, projects and also urban planning uh, within the office because we had these two hats <laughs> on uh, which we also have now with our office uh, like uh, we work I mean with small scale furniture design and large scale urban planning. But uh, I don't think that, that that's something you can just like, um, 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 what you could say, invent. It's it just happens somehow if you are fascinated about it uh, and and uh, and uh, show show kind of um, uh, engagement to to learn it and to to perform, then we had the, the possibility to have that chance, you could say. And um, was it back then um, Kobe already so big or was it a, a little smaller as an office? It was uh, much smaller. It, when we uh, came in, in 2011, I think there were 25 uh, 
employees yeah, in total. Yeah. And then when we left, it was like 90. And I guess, oh, I don't know what it is today, but uh, so it grew a lot, which was also fantastic to be involved in, to see how a, a relatively small office becomes uh, relatively big. Um, how, and how was the, I'm always curious you now because um, um, I think that for a lot of architects, it's fascinating to to be working for such an office like uh, the, that one, uh, but also like uh, I think uh, your office is also like very attractive, but yet more uh, still more niche. I think it's on the same way, but like uh, very very interesting. Uh, Work-wise, it seems the, for sure same level. It's not the same size yet. Um, but I'm curious, like when you started to work for that to, for that office, um, how was your lifestyle as like people? <laughs> Because um, did it involve uh, being uh, extremely long in the office, always long hours? Because I guess that also to achieve this kind of results, you need to put in a lot of work. And also, what um, what kind of lifestyle can an architect uh, in the different I don't know if there is any hierarchy at, at, at the office um, can afford an architect in, in Copenhagen. Yeah, are you referring now to our time at uh, Kobe or our own office? No, first Kobe because uh, um, yeah, yeah. because like I guess that when you have your own office that uh, it's uh, yeah. not a factor anymore. But when you're employed, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think nothing compares to being uh, your own boss because that uh, amount of work and uh, stress can, uh, I guess, uh, not be found in being a, an employee. But uh, obviously, I mean, there were long, long days and uh, tough deadlines and uh, and all kinds of situations. But uh, now I'm thinking, I mean, now it's what five years ago. I we stopped and I can't, uh, I, at least in my head, it doesn't feel like it was uh, completely crazy. It was quite, uh, I mean, it was of course a lot of hours and uh, the life uh, circulated quite a lot around the workplace and all the colleagues and friends you, you got, um, which was actually <clears throat> really, really nice because I think, I mean, that's maybe the most important part of our job is to find oh kind of be involved with with uh, good and uh, nice people and that's how you kind of manage to create something great so yeah yeah and i would also just say that uh, like the, it was a really nice uh, both social and professional environment and uh, that's also like uh, uh, i think it, it uh, it's also something that we i mean with our own firm also tries to to work with of course we're a smaller firm but we also uh try to have like a stimulating open kind of uh, uh platform for uh, doing having a nice office workplace but also uh what the kind of projects that we we work with um so so um uh, but as ted said uh running your own thing uh, uh includes so many more parameters than uh, than uh uh like uh, focusing on on just or just uh quotation <laughs> uh, sign uh, just doing architecture uh, if you can say like that it's, it doesn't really work on on a, on a, on a podcast to to say it like that but uh, you probably understand what i mean yeah uh, because uh, because it's like there 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 is like um, there is so many different things you need to to deal with all the time uh when when you run your own firm And and you have to, yeah, like you you have to because nobody else will take care in the same way that you would do. But uh, also, like what I was curious is like uh, what kind of lifestyle, like uh, in a sense, uh, what are the like? I don't want to know numbers or things like that, but uh, what are the um, wages in Denmark for uh, architects? I don't know. Here in Germany, we have different, uh, so to say, scales depending on your work experience. But um, this is just out of curiosity because a lot of people um, maybe are considering moving to Denmark or 
uh, would be curious to move to Denmark. Um, and <laughs> a lot of people have this, uh, for example, misconception that architects are these, uh, I don't know, rich people or things like that. So um, I'm just curious what kind of like, yeah, lifestyle could you afford in with the, as an architect in, in Copenhagen? As an employee, of course. I mean, like a uh, regular. I mean, uh, not being a millionaire and not uh, uh, having to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, pick scrap metal too. <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's in a quite uh, nice middle level. So you can go out and eat. I mean, to to sort of not talk about figures, you can you can afford a nice way of uh, living uh, and also uh, uh, bo both with the housing but also with um, with uh, going out dining and all these things um, it's a little bit tricky question I think to the answer because the, it also depends I mean, sorry uh, the yeah. best part of uh, like uh, no the lifestyle in Copenhagen as architect comes from not from the salary or the amount of money you get but uh, the social life that you get which is exactly. fantastic yeah, because the kind of amount of architects in Copenhagen is very, very uh, large uh, compared to the size of the city and the uh, distances are small and the offices know each other and they have uh, events together and it's even though it's kind of competition against each other, it's still like uh, outside the uh, outside work. It's still like very friendly and easy to to socialize and that's the biggest value I can see with uh, being an architect in Copenhagen. I think compared mm -hmm. to, for example, Helsinki, the scene is much smaller. Um, it's not as social uh, or active outside the office uh, life. So that's the biggest. But value. when there is a party, it's a really good party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have that experience also with uh, Danish uh, and Finnish people or general from that like um, when when partying and alcohol is involved in the equation, <laughs> things can go in <laughs> very different ways than, than usual. Uh, but I, I and I'm I'm curious like uh, are you guys yourself very because Ted you mentioned everybody are very competitive. Are you have you been guys? Do you need to be competitive like um, in school or at work or um, like? Is it a very, because as you said, from big numbers of architects, then there, there are also a lot of good architects. So uh, do you need to be very competitive uh, in that environment also to get, I don't know, the jobs or to get where you want to be? Yeah, I think uh, you have to probably have to be competitive, but there's different ways of, of being that. And I don't think we like, it doesn't feel like we've uh, Jonas and I ever have been like with our elbows out very hard like this and uh, no. kind of competing it by just by doing uh, doing your work and uh, I mean practicing and doing as good as you can being interested yeah. in the stuff that already <clears throat> takes you quite far. Yeah, um, because it's the whole thing is that you, as as uh, we have concluded, basically is that it's a quite social and, and open environment. So if you if you are an asshole or if you have very sharp elbows, then people know about it. And I I think that at least not coming from a entrepreneur background or uh, like having family members from uh, that has that kind of profession, uh, I have like throughout whole, whole my life I've, I've been like it, it, trying to be where it's fun and try to be where where it's happening in a way and i think that's also the same with the ted not having like the the big calculated plan but basically trying to be where the action is <laughs> where where it's amusing and where you learn and where you have a lot of fun uh, and i mean you spend so much time working whether you're an uh, you're an employee or whether you're an uh, you're uh, uh, self-employed, uh, so it needs to be a lot of fun and stimulating. So, so then you then you maybe get competitive. For example, uh, when we when we started the firm, um, I mean we didn't really have any concrete projects. We have had some savings uh, from from yeah as a buffer, and then you know the the account sort of ticks down, and they, we were just trying to find um, projects. Uh, uh to to sort of um get the uh, the office starting 
and then we won three uh, three uh, uh, of the first uh, competitions we did and then you know the the office uh, starts so 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 at that point we really uh, uh, were you know uh, very ambitious i mean we're still as ambitious but in a different way at that point it was like um, fighting to survive uh, for like uh, the first year basically uh, and then we won these three competitions that basically created the 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 foundation for the office yeah about being sorry no I, I you guys anticipated a little bit my question there would have been like really my next question is like um, how did you decide to transition from being employed at Kobe and to start your own office? Uh, like, um, how did you come up with the idea? It's actually, I think we already started talking about it when in school, like really at our master studies. And, uh, but it wasn't very concrete yet. We only knew that at some point we're going to aim for, mm. uh, starting establishing an office together and, uh, uh, that said, we were we were super happy at uh, at. I mean, we only had one workplace from our app between our studies and our own office, and we were really happy at that. I would say both of us really happy at Kobe uh, throughout the period we were there. And uh, but then, uh, like maybe two like two years before we started our own office, uh, we kind of started to plan a bit more uh, in detail, okay, Complete, what, yeah. Yeah, what could it be and uh, how could it be and uh, what should it be based on and uh, mm. kind of quite slowly, but like properly planning it uh, mm. in a way. And then at some point we felt like, okay, now we have a kind of vision of what our office could be and what could the long-term uh, aims be that maybe we need to take the kind of next step uh which was in 2000 and uh 15, uh, 15, we, 15 yeah. autumn yeah. yeah and then i mean it, it, we had a huge uh, game plan for the office but we didn't have any projects uh, <laughs> we, we, which was a bit uh, tricky yeah. and that's what Jonas referred to earlier that then we kind of mm. the first year we we tried our best to find some clients and then also doing uh, architecture competitions, whatever we could mm. find. What, what did you guys plan in these two years that you were talking about it? Like what was involved into that huge long planning? I mean, what kind of, what we, what we should focus on, uh, with, with our work, what kind of projects and, uh, what scales i mean now we do we work with all scales and that was the plan that we wanted to since we had a background from furniture design to urban planning and everything in between we we really wanted to kind of uh, establish an office that could work with with this like the old uh, classical offices and maybe also some of the new ones too mm. uh, but uh, and then everything also where we should be based and how it should be i mean the idea of having an office both in copenhagen and helsinki that was that was in the plan but when we started we were both in uh, copenhagen and we didn't know when the helsinki uh, office would actually be started it was some somewhere in the future and my home was mm. in copenhagen and my family oh mm. yeah family was also there and there wasn't a time span for when the Helsinki kind of connection would would happen. But then after these three first competitions that we won, they were all in, in Finland. And then suddenly we had a kind of demand uh, to kind of uh, start designing the project that we won in Finland. So we kind of established the Helsinki Helsinki office quite quite quickly. I think quicker than what we thought in the in the beginning. Mm. Yeah. And and I mean that that was kind of the the uh, I mean it, there was a plan like a vision, uh, but there was no like concrete steps because doing competitions you cannot plan to win, of course. <laughs> uh, so so that that's um, 
that was kind of the the there was a game plan but not like a concrete steps of how to get to the long term uh, goal i i i see and what were these first um now uh, what were these first uh, competition so you first established that like i guess one day you went to your superiors and said hey guys we're living um um we're starting our own office i don't know if you said it like uh i'm curious also first of all if the people at kobe were like i don't know keeping the door opens for you in case everything went, <laughs> went downhills and uh so so you went uh solo without any project um and then which were these first competitions that you that you took part in that sort of the give you some uh sort of um height to start working yeah i mean for a uh, short uh answer to the previous uh, question that how we actually left the Kobe I, I have to say it wasn't uh it wasn't the e like easiest uh, discussion we've had I think uh, at least I will remember it uh, but in the end I think uh, that was also I mean now we are, we are still uh, really good friends with a lot of uh lot of the people at Kobe and uh, and uh I think the way it ended was also super super good i mean uh, it wasn't they didn't close the door and then we never heard of them anymore so it, uh, we've had a lot of uh, discussions about and i think we've had some help also and uh, and uh, advice and all this so it was it was uh it was great to keep a good yeah leave with a good uh, I think face and smile yeah i think that also that uh, probably came up uh, i i hope that this is something that um they uh they appreciated was that we were very transparent and like you know we didn't do anything uh, on the side really uh before we stopped uh that was also why we didn't have any projects <laughs> so we were like yeah uh, uh we were not like competitive until we stopped basically uh, and i have to say that also uh before before we went into the meeting room uh to just sort of uh, uh lay lay the news uh we had like actually prepared for a lot of different scenarios because uh i, I don't want to call myself paranoid but i would want to have been prepared for like uh, you know uh, uh different scenarios so so like um so uh, so I, I think that and we did it also just before christmas just just sort of you know let it sink in and all these things and then and then we ask them sort of how how do you want us to stop in a way you know so so that it works for for the uh, them and also works for us so i think i mean uh, it's probably good if anyone uh, works at a place and want to start their own firm uh, i would say again going back to not having sharp elbows it's probably better to to you know um, uh, to sort of uh, uh, have a good uh, dialogue with them and there is a there is a, a good quote from an author called uh, Toby Young, uh, who said um, uh, that uh, you always want to take care of who you meet on the way up because you never know who you're going to meet on the way down. Uh, 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 so I mean, it's always important that you um, that you uh, uh, that you sort of take care of of the people you have around you because um, uh, you don't know wh where you're going to be in the future. But um, yeah. But that was kind um, of the the, yeah. the 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 ending. But then, yeah, the the three competitions that we did was they were all like uh, urban planning, uh, and all, all located in in Finland, uh, different scales. One of them, the biggest one, was this. Uh, it was an international competition for a new uh, kind of city district in in Tampere in, in Finland. Tampere is the the second uh, biggest city of Finland and an uh, open international competition that we 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 did and, and won and and that was kind of a a really nice start for for our office because partly there was of course uh, we managed to finance some other projects with with that and uh, with the let's say the prize money but also then the through the kind of the project itself that that went through two or three years 
to create a master plan together with the the client, which was the city and all our other consultants involved, and, and that was really a, a really a nice uh, backbone or uh, stable backbone for the the company to evolve around. And the other one was a smaller urban urban planning competition in called urban plan uh, an area in in Uvascula, kind of old industrial. Uh, uh, area which was uh, being developed into a new neighborhood next to the city center and uh, this was the kind of center part of, of that area and uh, we, we managed to win that one also and then the third one was uh, even smaller it was a kind of a in a in a very nice uh, town in the Finnish archipelago on kind of the gate to the islands in the Finnish archipelago on the southwestern coast, they had a kind of a harbor area, which is quite, you know, quite bad uh, kind of, uh, um, let's say, kind of in a bad shape, and it doesn't have any, very much activity, and it, but it has all the potentials. So that was a kind of a mostly landscape and uh, and planning the harbor front and uh, the kind of harbor walk and some uh, housing and uh, hotel uh, much 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 smaller scale than the other ones yeah so the the largest one was one and a half million square meters uh for twenty five thousand citizens and ten thousand workplaces uh, and the smallest one was around the twenty thousand square meter urban plan with the hotels and um, and uh, recreational functions basically and uh, so very different in scale and context and uh, from there on you got some some um, some fluidity so to say to to keep going uh, but how did you end up and end up setting the initial the initial uh, work of your office like uh, uh, did you split directly since the beginning so you went back to Finland Ted or uh, did you had a little of uh, an office first in Copenhagen and were you just the two of you guys working on this project or you had some also help from I don't know you uh, did you have also already employees or interns or friends we had a collaborate actually we had a collaborator on each one of these uh, projects in a way but within the office it was uh, us the two of us and uh, and two uh, students helping mm. uh, during the first year and then then yeah. uh, we decided quite quickly to that we needed an office space in Helsinki to be there on kind of on site or at least in the same country and that's when we in the beginning we uh, the first employee uh, that was a tough tough uh, kind of uh, decision to open an office in a country where you're not yourself and to to figure out who you want to work with and kind of be responsible for for that because it took some time before i managed uh, i decided to move back it, it was a year and a half that i was going back and forth between copenhagen and Helsinki, and uh, it was also quite fluent and uh, i mean still today we we work as one office even though we are in two locations so we haven't split up the work you know we still kind of work on the same projects together and uh, mm. now during the pandemic it's been very natural for us because we've had the same situation with remote working uh, for many years already yeah and, and also the, the so the setup is basically the same and and i i think the only I haven't been in Helsinki for uh, one, uh, almost one and a half year now. Soon, it feels completely crazy. <laughs> uh, uh, and Co and Ted has not been in Copenhagen for one and a half year uh, to uh, to be at at the the Copenhagen office. So that's of course that that's probably the longest time we've been uh, physically apart for since for the last uh, twelve years almost. Um, uh, so so it's. Uh, uh, that's a little bit strange, but as Ted said, uh, the, the uh, we speak with each other every day. We send sketches back and forth between the offices. Uh, we have some di different, 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 <laughs> different uh, uh, digital platforms that we use uh, to organize our work and to communicate. 
and then we also have a server set up in a way that it um, uh, that it's constantly syncing between uh, uh, Copenhagen and uh, and Helsinki. And uh, when you guys started, you said that you have prepared, like you have planned it, and you have saved saved a little money. Um, uh, did you plan, like I don't know, a certain amount of money that would have made you survive for I don't know a certain amount of time and like uh, counting back? <laughs> like uh, I mean, I like your style, guys, because it feels like. Uh, it feels like that um, ba Batman movie, the last one with Bane, where it, he's in a prison, you know, in this uh, in this uh, deep hole, and to to get out, he need to jump without the rope because if you have the rope, you feel too safe and you <laughs> you won't be under pressure yeah. enough. So uh, was it the same for you? Like you had this, I don't know, uh, savings. Uh, you, I guess you have. I, I don't know if you needed initial any initial big investment uh, maybe computers and softwares and stuff like that and then from there on counting back how long you're gonna stay alive was that the initial start i think no i think we we planned all kinds of things uh, circulating around architecture and what we want to do and how we want to do but actually the economic on a finance part we didn't plan at all in, like looking back, it was a bit uh, maybe crazy that we just said, okay, yeah. now we start. We don't have, I mean, I definitely didn't have a plan of how many months we could uh, last. We just yeah. hoped and they worked uh, our asses off. And actually, yeah. uh, the first, uh, talking about big in investments, I think the first computer we got to remember, Jonas, we built it in my apartment with, with exactly. a friend of ours, this guy who knew exactly. something about computers. He came yeah. to my my apartment and <clears throat> we needed uh, some um, rendering power uh, yeah. to our laptops and we we couldn't uh, buy a proper uh, machine so we Render bought this stuff, I yeah. yeah no yeah we bought this ikea cupboard and then built into the ikea cupboard uh, a computer that could help us with the with the kind of uh, that was our first computer that we got yeah. Yeah, and and then and then like uh, I mean we made some some um, uh, uh, money uh, with smaller pro projects that we did, uh, but not not anything that was sort of something you could start a firm on, but that went directly to office rents or to to buying computers for us and for the interns. Um, uh, so uh, so, but there was like there was like this kind of. Uh, uh, you could say, could say like a economic hourglass that sort of ticked down all the time, uh, and and I think that the Bane metaphor, or actually, I mean, it's actually um, Bruce Wayne that uh, does the jumping in the end. I mean, when he gets out of it, uh, uh, I mean, Bane did it when he was a kid, but Christian Bale did it when he was uh, maybe my age, <laughs> like around forty or thirty-five or something, and then uh, yeah, because it, I was thirty-five when we started. But it, it, it's just maybe a good um, good uh, metaphor to say that you need to have maybe a little bit of pressure so you know, uh, yeah, that you you push yourself to, uh, to 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 maybe make uh, take some chances, but also to, to that that creates some opportunities. Um, so it's I always mean, two sides of the coin. Yeah. You know, that right? said, like the art field of architecture and architecture office, I'm not saying it's kind of risk-free but i mean that we are not building a factory and we are not uh, we didn't have to take a huge loan to start some uh, production so in the end what, the only thing you can lose is the fact that okay we didn't uh, it didn't work so we we need to try to find a new job that's the that's the only risk in, in a way and that's at least I try to remind myself when it when it feels like okay now there's a lot of pressure, so then it's okay. But you know, I mean, there's no factory that needs to be uh, sold or closed or anything. It's just uh, no. yes, that's true. Like uh, someone that uh, it's employed, I always think like. Uh, when I'm switching jobs, I think, oh, the worst thing it can happen, I get fired. <laughs> yeah. But for for my boss, it would be worse if something happens. Yeah. So yeah, I think everybody tries to calm calm down somehow in that yeah. way. Like, oh, I'll find a new job, 
And um, yeah, you need to have some sort of mental kind of uh, thing. But I think that the longer the office exists, the more it sort of feels like, you know, it, it is like a baby that you want to nurse uh, and want to make sure that uh, he or she <laughs> has has a good uh, good time and uh, enjoys it. And uh, I mean, I'm talking about the company as an individual almost like that. It becomes um, something that you kind of uh, really want to take care for. So I think that the longer you have the firm, the it was in the beginning, it was more like, uh, uh, as Ted described, yeah, exactly. but the longer it exists, I think the more you really want to, you want to kind of see that all the hours and the, the in, invested money, because even if it's not a factory, you still have invested quite a lot of money in like licenses and uh, time. Uh, like computers and um, yeah, stop time, exactly, a lot of time. <laughs> so I think yeah. that that's, it becomes more and more like um, uh, something that you really want to nurse and take care of as an organism almost. And um, I'm curious, um, what kind of, like I always ask this question because I, I know it sounds li like cheesy because I mean, if we were about to talk about your process, design process, I think podcast, it's very difficult to like, it would be, it would need to be more a video medium uh, and maybe in the future will be, um, but, um, and also like you need long time to learn very well how to, to, to do a design process in the mental way which is the most important one but what kind of um softwares did you start with in the beginning and uh, what kind of softwares do you use now if something changed uh, also like what i really love about your office is that when you when you open your your website or your instagram or everything the publications that have been published by other media um the images of your projects are really really beautiful um i i guess those maybe are done by someone exter external but in the beginning uh maybe investing on renderings from external Ooh, i don't know if it was uh the case so what kind of uh what kind what kind of software did you start with and did you do you use what is the process mm -hmm. the workflow like on hands-on the most important tool is the pencil still. And uh, that's the one that has been used the most from the beginning. But otherwise, I mean, we talk about software. So I yeah. mean, we've been Anything. using uh, Rhino and, uh, uh, and now with uh, lately with the more constructing uh, projects, also Archicad and uh, but for like visualizations and presenting uh, ideas, uh, I mean, it's Rhino and then we've used, what, we use B-Ray and Enscape. And this is kind of the normal, normal uh, tools that we use in our everyday process. Yeah. Yeah. So basically like if we just talk about the tools, uh, I mean, it's basically a lot of hand sketches, some models and then uh, 3D modeling and then uh, visualization, visualizing via V-Ray or um, or uh, Enscape, basically. That's that's kind of the. Um, uh, and then we also use external render firms for uh, uh, some projects, not all, but some. Um, and then, uh, uh, as Ted said, when it when it becomes a concrete project, then we work with uh, uh, Archicad. I also like noticed like what I really love because I told you like that I when I was studying um, like I was sort of uh, this investigative architect um, because uh, f um, as I said I would navigate uh, sometimes even with Google Maps and go in a different city and see what architects would do there and I guess this is how I found you I'm pretty sure this is the way I found you and um, and when I was uh, doing my thesis, uh, I had a very particular uh, experience with my thesis. I did that uh, now three years ago uh, or two years ago um, because um, I was doing it from Frankfurt, but at the university in Rome. 
And so when I went back to, sometimes I would fly back just to do my correction with my teacher and I would show all these pictures of different references and she would ask me, how do you know all these offices? And this is, uh, this is how I found uh, you. And I found, like what I really loved, what was really remarkable for me also from your work were the sketches because um, you do all your concepts um, you represent them um, in a sketchy way, in a very sketchy way. And it looks very simple. They're like doodles a little bit, like a very beautiful, but look like doodles, like something that you are sketching. And I really love this style and I was trying to reverse engineering. I was like, I'm going to try to do it also like them. <laughs> and then uh, uh, I tried different uh, techniques. Um, and also my doodling wasn't that good as yours. And then I thought maybe they have a digital tablet to do it so well. So how do you guys do those things? Because I probably tried to reverse engineer them for them for many months. <laughs> Give that's us the a, trick. That's, that's a trade secret that we can. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it gets uh, quicker and quicker all the time. It's actually unless less technology for each year it's like nowadays it's a i think at the beginning we tried to scan them in like uh, i mean we draw them by hand uh with a pen uh, either a like this ink ball pen that's the this one. The, yeah that kind <laughs> of pen and then uh then we in the beginning i think we tried to scan and then you take them into photoshop and you and I don't do the coloring and all this, but nowadays it's like you take a photo really from fast. quite far yeah. away already. So it kind of, it becomes less, uh, it doesn't look so scanned. And then you kind of tune that in uh, very quickly in, yeah. in, in the Photoshop and it takes a minute and, or two. Yeah. And, and, and the funny thing is that like, I mean, everybody, we encourage everybody in the office to sketch. And uh, even though, I mean, it, it is actually if every, anyone would look through all the sketches on our on our homepage, it's not uh, or or also in the project uh, descriptions and all these things, it's not always only minor Ted sketches like that. We take the sketches that looks good uh, and use them in the process. But since me and Ted are involved in a lot of projects, like. Uh, so it's not that that me and Ted have to do the the sketch. If it looks good, then we use it in the presentation, uh, and if it's communicative. But often it is that the reason why there is a lot of minor Ted sketches uh, involved in the project presentations is because when we talk uh, with the, with the, the teams, uh, we sketch like and formulate uh, what the ideas are. So there is like uh, very, very uh, filled uh, sketchbooks with every every uh, colleague in the office. Uh, so I think we really encourage all our uh, our uh, colleagues to um, to uh, to uh, sketch because because then you also you know you know your project so much more uh, when you when you can draw it in the way that you are capable of uh, because you think so much more uh, through like what you what you can perceive in your head and then also what you can get down on paper and, and then of course then you take it into physical models and then into um, into uh, 3d to test if uh, if it works and if it uh, it fits with the program if it's with the context uh, or whatever you want to achieve with it uh, but like technically it's a very kind of direct uh, uh, I, I personally love the most when when we have done a sketch really really early uh, in the in the process when we just maybe read the program and that sketch can be used in the presentation. That doesn't happen all the time, but I think that that's kind of the, the most uh, enjoyable. And then you might not win the project or uh, whatever, but I think it's kind of beautiful when you sort of the first notion that you get from reading the program and reading the um, understanding the context. And then when that becomes the driving sketch, I think that that's kind of a, a beautiful thing. So there is like, both the analytic side and the kind of accumul accumulated knowledge and intuition embedded in into one sketch somehow. For the matter of fact, I uh, figured out that it was handmade and I scanned one of mine too. But what I couldn't manage is to figure this white background because as soon as there is a little uh, spot on the paper and you scan it, it's also visible in the 
<laughs> in on the scan paper. Yeah. So I was pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> the, the worse the photography, the better the sketch. Yes, yes, I, I, <laughs> I would say almost. Yeah, I, I, I figure out that. But um, yeah, no, I've, um, as I said, I've been, I've been also, of course. I mean, I now hear say most of the superficial things that you can say, but like uh, I've been also really um, analyzing uh, what you what you guys plan, and uh, I can tell you also that uh, my favorite uh, project that uh, I saw for the first time was um, this Kangas City of Garden. And uh, this was uh, uh, like for the people who are listening only, they can go to your website and, and visit among the projects. They're all very beautiful, but that for sure is um, my favorite of your work. Mm -hmm. um, so w how is like currently um, the office? Are you still participating in a lot of competitions or are you now focused more on projects that you have already acquired and um, has the pandemic anyhow impacted your uh, sort of so to say tra trajectory of developing as a company too no we definitely uh, uh, participate in a lot of competitions uh, all the time and it's not only to uh, to kind of to get projects is also to get the interesting projects. What I mean, quite often uh, the most uh, interesting projects are are uh, through competitions in a way. So so that's definitely part of what we do all the time. And then of course the other part is to to make sure that the competitions that have been won and the projects that uh, have been commissioned that the the end result is as good as possible, and that's uh, even more important uh, in in some level on some level. Uh, so uh, for the about the pandemic, that uh, luckily in Finland there's quite a lot of both open competitions and invited competitions uh, all the time. So so uh, so we've had the chance to participate. Uh, um, in quite a few lately also but uh, I think the next next couple of years there it will be super exciting to see the the ideas that were generated a couple of years back to actually come be, become reality so uh, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, building sites and uh, uh, projects uh, that are being built at the moment mm -hmm. which is uh, really fun fun to see work on yeah so it's like a mix of uh, invited competitions both in denmark sweden and uh, and uh, finland uh, and then doing open competitions also to sort of uh, try to uh, and commissions of course uh, but trying to sort of uh, trying to sort of move move the office uh, forward in a in a good pace i wouldn't say fast and i wouldn't say slow but a good pace so that the Every time we do a new project, it's, it, it, it makes the company grow uh, in, uh, in the right direction, you could say. Um, because that's like um, how we have done it so far, and that's how I, we think we want to continue to, to develop the office. Yes, well, um, I think that the pace is uh, relative for everyone, you know, like everyone have their own pace and... Uh, no, I mean, no matter, no matter how how good you are, sometimes also you need a little bit of luck, and uh, I mean, that's very, you know, sometimes some things you cannot, you cannot uh, keep in control. You can only work for, as you guys said before, to be the the best you can be, and then results are coming, no matter in which uh, with which um, with which pace. And is this project that I mentioned also currently under construction? Is it one of those that it's gonna come to reality anytime soon, or can you share which projects uh, we will be able to see soon, or walk through, or mm. take pictures yeah. of? But that, yeah, that actually the Kanga City of Gardens. That's that was originally a kind of 
that was one of the first urban plans for for the in Uvascula. and I mean the the plans and the kind of starting points for the de the development have have been done uh, by us together with the client, but then all the let's say all the buildings and the physical uh, context is then uh, developed by different actors uh, with the kind of starting points that we've uh, initiated. So it will be, it's being developed and will be built uh, where we, of course, not in that case, we can't control everything. We are not designing all the buildings. But uh, one of the projects that is going to be uh, completed uh, quite soon is actually, it's not on the website. It's in the, in the news chapter, I think. It's this uh, market square pavilions in uh, my hometown in, in Turku. I think they can, yeah, on the on our Instagram and uh, LinkedIn and uh, on the news this, uh, chapter on the website. It looks sort of like a wooden, a wooden, a f a f yeah. fluid wood. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that exactly. is being yeah. constructed and uh, completed very soon. Uh, and uh, I think we are lo looking very much forward to see it completed because yeah. now it's very close to to uh, being realized and it's and it looks uh, very much like the original ideas and visions we had which is uh, mm. very fun to see yeah and i think that that that's like uh, ted uh, i mean i would really want to be on the building site every once in a while i've never i never really seen it in reality but uh, ted uh, was there last was it last friday right friday, yeah. when you sent the you took pictures. He took pictures with a good camera, but then took pictures of the display of the camera with his cell phone. And I could almost, you know, uh, I got completely uh, entangled. I have been looking at those uh, ones for um, quite a, quite a few times now because it's really starting to look uh, 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 good. And and that's uh, that's also the fun thing with architecture that. Uh, if all the guys uh, on the site or girls uh, uh, and all the people involved uh, are committed with uh, uh, ma making uh, uh, th the good work needed to make a fantastic uh, space uh, and a meeting place, uh, th then that, that's when the sort of the architect's idea somehow becomes materialized or the architect's plural uh, uh, becomes materialized is by craftsmen and uh, new technology, technological uh, uh, production methods and all these things. And I think that it's been a very fantastic collaboration with a lot of different um, uh, producers to achieve this uh, uh, building. Um, th th so it's like, a, it's it's good teamwork. Like there, there needs to be a, a good and strong idea, um, but then it's like just a lot of teamwork uh, to uh, to bring the, the project from uh, from an idea to a, a good uh, uh, environment in the end. Why, why did you guys decide not to officially pu publish this project on, on your website, but just uh, post a few captures? It's actually, <laughs> it's strange, ready to uh, be... Because we actually have it, yeah. It's, uh, it's ready to be published, but at the moment we are very close to completely updating uh, our website so we now we decided okay now when the new yeah. website in a couple of weeks will be published we put it there and then everyone can see it i and yeah. and probably by the yeah. time by the time the podcast is published it will be also the new website so um people people will be able to see already the updated version and and if if uh, if not like as soon as um as soon as the project is completed uh you can send me the pictures and i will be sharing them on the uh creative insider instagram so that uh because i think uh, that's a very nice connection between the media uh, i often have then actually posted some visual parts of the podcast on instagram so that the people can reconnect to to the to, to what we have talked about did did you guys use uh, grasshopper or some parametric design to to make this uh, very interesting shape or it was already uh, again only sketches and <laughs> 3d models and do you implement these uh, different technologies also in your office because you have some pretty um, interesting shapes in some of your projects i have to say i mean we've used uh, 
or some guys in the office have used uh, a grasshopper and we kind of utilize it when it's <clears throat> it's needed but in this uh, pavilions project it's actually uh, modeled uh, very uh, precisely uh, with the traditional <laughs> rhino uh, method without so grasshopper yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could it could have been drawn basically like uh, with a good engineer and uh, and just the tools that we have now it could have been done uh, not a hundred years ago but but maybe like 60 70 years ago uh, because it is quite straightforward forwardly uh, 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 thought actually mm. uh, so so it's um, so so uh, it, it went from like good discussion about um, it, it's it's hard to describe the process here but we did we did a, we did a like um, a table conver round table conversation at the Porto architecture school last Friday uh, and then we went through this project uh, uh, it was also online of course uh, but um, but it was uh, there we went through the project and and then it's quite nice to see like the first initial sketches which are very kind of conceptual and diagrammatic and then when you see the the result how it's becoming now there is like there is a strong relationship between it but you but you can really see how it went from an idea to a, a spatial concept uh, and uh, programmatically configured uh, space and then uh, to 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 the result that we have now so it, it is a little bit fun to sort of backtrack also that uh, but hard to to commute convey or communicate over a, a podcast i would say no, yeah, for sure. The people can go then uh, on. There will be this links in uh, the description of the podcast, so they will just be able to click and go through all the. I mean, I I, I have um, I have a folder in my browser with some of my favorite companies, and you're among those. So once in a while, I would go just on the website to see. Oh, let's see what the guys are doing, and uh, then I would click through, and all the images and all the projects are very beautiful and and it's very in, enjoyable um and um i'm curious in this process with the office since you have started your office uh what were um what were the tasks that you um had to learn very quickly to deal with on this site um on, on that are not directly involved with architecture because also you mentioned a lot um, how you try to build uh, besides nice projects a nice team uh, a nice environment uh, and also you need to make everything uh, within like profitable because otherwise you cannot actually pay your employees um, so do you guys had learned something uh, actively also maybe with books or similar i don't know coaching um, about i don't know leadership or business or because some of my guests for example have had business coaches or things like that we have a couple of this kind of let's say mentor uh, uh, persons who who we can discuss all kinds of things with related to to running a business and uh, i think that has been very very helpful to get get advice on things that you don't learn in architecture school and maybe not even as a employee uh, at an office so that's but uh, and there's also a lot of things that we learned the hard way uh, <laughs> uh, doing mistakes and it's i mean it's always good to make mistakes so you learn but uh, yeah, I have to say that, like, I think that uh, f for me, for me at least, uh, I'm now. Now this is flattering you, Ted, but I am learning, like, uh, from our conversations about how to approach things, uh, uh, because here we are. I mean, we are a little bit dif uh, different, also in this aspect. But uh, I mean, I I also ask other people um, uh, for for input, but mainly I think that a lot of the 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 day-to-day -day, uh, uh, issues or potentials or whatever it is that we're we're going uh, uh, going to have a, on our table, uh, we talk about it like uh, every day, and and I think that that, that has at least been the most uh, valuable uh, input for me to develop as a 
as a business person. But then, of course, you pick up uh, the tips and tricks from from as Ted says, like um, uh, mentors or uh, more kind of senior uh, people in our environment. But uh, but a lot of the things um, that uh, that can be challenging. I, I think we we uh, talk a lot about that, uh, how to approach it in a, in in our manner. You could say. Yes. I, and um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm an, still an employee, but uh, I like to inform myself with books about different aspects. And I think that also when you're employee, no matter if you're employer or employee, you're in charge of something. So if you start learning about these things, uh, it's, I think there are skills that are within us. Um, but when you read them or somebody tells you something, uh, you just figure out that you know this thing but you can actually mm. actively be aware of this knowledge and not only um you understand yourself more i think um yeah and uh, do you have any um active like near goals for the next few years that you have set up for yourself where you want to head to uh or some s uh, milestones that you have in front of of you so to say yeah i mean as an office obviously we we want to i mean the big goal i don't know if the if it's the next couple of years but the big goal is is probably to kind of be in a in a position or in a role where you, act, you can actually have a, a big influence on how how our environments are being built whether it's in a uh, urban situation or, or something else to really be the kind of the the player in the game that has actually an, an influence i think that's uh of making a better kind of physical environment that's the big goal and then how it, how it's done and uh with what kind of resources that's then uh, the kind of trick that we need to figure out yeah yeah so basically it's like uh, working with the scales that we have started to work with from day one and then to try to just um uh, yeah continue to continue to be involved in uh, in projects where where you can create a good uh, uh, physical environment for for people or for for um, for also the nature of course uh, so that there is like uh, a good balance because i think that no matter what you do in the field of uh, of building uh, we have not branded our office like um, that we only work with uh, uh, with nature or we only work with uh, reuse or we only use with uh, work with wood we have not branded our office like that but in every project uh, uh, the, the conversations almost always start with like how can we make this place uh, fantastic also for all the people that are not going to use the buildings or environments every day but just for the people who are going to pass them and then of course uh, nature uh, nice materials uh, uh, like uh, some something that is kind of uh, tangible uh, becomes uh, uh, important parameters to to include in in the projects so so we we don't have like a, a kind of uh, verified uh, process tool to to uh, secure all these parameters in the project but all the project starts basically with how can the general public benefit from it uh, of course also the client and the users but also how can this be a, um, a long-term sustainable project with the investment uh, put in in uh, resources money uh, time uh, and how that can then uh, be a part of creating a more positive future yeah uh, that's i mean the that's, more, most important things well that's maybe the only way to kind of create also ownership in in the projects that we do like uh, it's not only about the specific user or the specific client it's also as you want to said the uh, extended family <laughs> uh, people are, who will be affected by it that, that that creates ownership and that's what we kind of aim for that every project we do has a strong ownership yeah i think uh, you can see that in the many of the project and of the concepts that you guys um have on have uh produced and and have showed and i think i don't know um 
I want to ask you too, like, do you know what might be the reason why this um, spirit uh, which you guys have and a lot of the pe people in the community of designers and architects within the Scandinavian cultures um, is so strong? Because um, I don't think it's only, you know, a matter of uh, resources in a sense that you guys live in also the uh, countries are very good well set up economically i would say because i i live in a country like germany which um uh it's also in a very good position economically or on the resource wise but uh it's not um i don't know there is a little bit of um not it's not so brave to to go with actually building some some more uh brave ideas is there any any cultural thing that makes uh, people in Scandinavia not only as designers but also the clients that you have to go with this uh, to go with these ideas? Yeah, <clears throat> I, yeah. I wouldn't say maybe that I'm not sure that there is a dif difference. I'm not sure that we are more bold up here than in, uh, for example, Germany. Uh, maybe but uh i mean it doesn't feel like every every crazy idea that we come up with is is kind of accepted and uh, built uh, unfortunately it would be great but uh it's quite it can be quite tough up here also so uh mm. so uh, but uh, maybe i mean if you look back in history of course there's some uh, uh boldness uh kind of uh built into the culture, maybe, um, at least in, in Denmark, I would say, maybe more than in Finland. Uh, but uh, yeah, but I think one. one 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 interesting thing is that when we talk about like uh, architecture in the broad sense, or or when we talk about like what, what fascinates me and Ted, like both if it's art or boats or uh, uh, architecture or uh, Ted is a fantastic sailor, by the way. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I think that we look like uh, uh, look like uh, at a lot of different things, from Carlos Scarpa to uh, to uh, uh, you know ancient times uh, or uh, or uh, mid -Euro mid European uh, offices like uh, from Switzerland or. Austria or Germany or and also like Portuguese and Spanish uh, we, we look at like uh, uh, look at uh, a lot of different uh, ways of working but then in the end when when uh, a reference uh, goes through like our machinery you could say then uh, then it maybe is filtered through some kind of um, understanding of how we kind of uh, 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 approach within the office like the, the 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 assignment so there is a lot of international references we don't really sit down and uh, feel that oh we're going to do a nordic project this time or like you know it, it's going to feel like a um like a, a super kind of uh, open and um, and uh, uh, we don't we don't we don't have that many kind of preset parameters to to kind of validate the project besides ecology uh, and um, and uh, that it's going to be beneficial for more than just the, the the interior or something like that so 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 there's a lot of different things that kind of adds up to to the output uh, that comes from a lot of different um, uh, directions i would say and parts of the world Yes, I. I mean, it's that's understandable. And nowadays we're very interconnected. But I was, um, yeah. I think I don't know. If, if viewed from from outside, uh, it seems like there is this m he bigger spirits of um, exploration, and uh, then up actually realizing these uh, these ideas up up there. And uh, I hope that uh, as soon as the pandemic situation, it's. Um, better uh, I will be able to finally uh, go back to my traveling plans and uh, maybe I can do a little uh, tour in Copenhagen and then um, Helsinki and uh, 
go to enjoy the actually built market by then uh yeah, and yeah. and then meet you, meet you in in person uh and i want to conclude our conversation because you mentioned all the references you go for um i always uh, I, i want to you know create sort of a collection of uh, a toolbox for inspiration for uh, the listeners whenever they might feel uninspired to go and check some of the inspiration um, uh, sources of our of our guests when uh, what what is something that you do when you need to feel uh, inspired again maybe do you have a favorite book movie a place where you go or I don't know activity you do yeah I mean uh, me personally I like to to read books and I kind of, uh, of like uh, history and of course <laughs> for some reason i don't know where it comes from but uh, kind of uh, european history and then within that uh, some kind of uh, biographies that's kind of my typical thing that i do when i don't do architecture so, do you, except of course go saving that's as you want to mention that's my favorite hobby do you have much. any biography that you like in a particular way or that you would suggest that we might try reading Uh, well, some of the latest ones are uh, that I read uh, uh, the Obama's this uh, what is it called the, the promised land uh, well, that was the latest one I read uh, this uh, lately but um, otherwise another one uh, is this one by um, it's about um, Churchill what is he called the author well it doesn't matter uh, it was about church The Church Just, of uh, Biography. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. What about you, Jonas? Uh, I mean, I, I'm currently reading uh, two books, uh, one by a friend uh, of mine, uh, which is actually, um, I, I have like 10 pages uh, 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 left, and it's called uh, The Pack uh, Flocken, which is about the COVID strategy uh, in Sweden. Uh, it's one of my childhood friends called his name is Johan Anderberg and it's very very uh, I'm, I'm not I'm biased <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, even though um, uh, it is a friend of mine uh, it's really like a cliffhanger each chapter uh, so it's a real page turner so I'm reading that one just because it just got out uh, and then uh, I'm reading uh, uh, Jansson uh, Jansson uh, the art book uh, like which is almost like a dictionary uh, of art history an like old classical book but that is more like a, that I sort of open every once in a while and then I read like um, uh, David Sylvester I think his name is with a, in a conversation with Francis Bacon so like interviews over some years I just bought that book also like uh, uh, two two months ago uh, and I, I'm sort of in the middle uh, so I have a few different ones um, so, so that, that's in relation to books I think it's a lot of art books and art catalogs and uh, uh, that I uh, that I read um, and then and then I like time subscription uh, that uh, I'm always like two numbers behind but it's also fascinating to 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 dig into like um, Uh, facts, uh, uh, hardcore facts. I think uh, in relation to to uh, to kind of yeah, fill the head with something else than architecture and art. Um, but um, so so yeah, so that's kind of what I fill my time with. And then I also have a son who is uh, soon becoming four year years old. So that also takes a lot of time. <laughs> uh, He's also a little bit of a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> That must be a little bit more than a hobby, <laughs> but it's a fun way to to put it in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, guys, so uh, it was a, a big uh, honor for me and pleasure to to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you. Uh, I will be putting all the directions to your website and to to your Instagram in, in the description of the podcast so that uh, people who are listening can go and give some uh, visual uh, add-on to this conversation and see your work. And um, yeah, I don't want to take away any, of, any more of your free time, 
but thank you for for accepting the invitation and it was a, a huge pleasure for me thank you very much it's thank been you very a much. really nice time and pleasure to be here enjoy your yeah. evening yeah the same to you thanks you too Hey friends, thank you very much for listening to this podcast. You've been amazing. Before we go, I just want to remind you that if you want to support us, you can just go on the creativeinsider.com where uh, you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter or you can follow us on our social media channels which are Instagram at TCI Podcast or the LinkedIn page, The Creative Insider. Uh, by doing this you will have a bigger social media presence which always looks attractive to more and more important guests and so this is very fundamental and if you really love what we do and you want to help us doing a better production just click on the patreon link below where you can support us with the wished amount of money you think it's okay for you Uh, it's a monthly subscription but you can cancel anytime So thank you very much and have a good week, guys. Bye-bye.